Well, I say a welcome everybody or welcome back. Uh, we took a little bit of a high anxious between the last talk and this talk, but I'm happy we're resuming with our Wednesday afternoon in country a Palazzo. And uh, tonight, I'm very happy to be uh, saying a few words uh, about Stanford alum and uh, dear friend Mark Luton, who is a Swiss national and who has lived in Milan since 1992. Mm -hmm. He splits his time between Switzerland and Italy. Mark holds a number of degrees. He's got a BA in physical chemistry from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. He has a master's of science degree in nuclear physics from the University of California at Berkeley, we'll forgive you for that, <laughs> where he did research at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labor Laboratory. But he also, and most importantly, he holds a BA, an MBA, I'm sorry, from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, Mark's career has been quite dynamic. He worked in the oil industry for several years. Several years. He then pursued a career in the pharmaceutical industry where he rose to become a senior exec executive and held a variety of management positions in Switzerland, Spain, Argentina, Mexico, and Italy. Since 1997, he has been a principal of a Swiss internet outsourcing company he co-founded. Mark and his wife Connie, who's also a Stanford alumna, alumna, are both very close friends of our program and longtime members of the Stanford Alumni Club of Italy. The club, which recently celebrated its 25th anniversary, brings together Stanford alumni who are residing in Italy in an effort to forge and maintain a strong sense of community. Uh, the club has a very close relationship with our program, and over the years there have been many occasions on which our students have met with the group of alumni both in Florence and in Milan. Mark and Connie have been particularly generous with their time and with their home because they've often opened it up for uh, our students, hosting them whenever they went up to Milan. Today is our second speaker of our spring quarter in Contrea Palazzo series. Marco, Mark will be discussing a very unique topic. The title of his talk is Cosmology Light, a lesson in galactic geography. Thank you, Mark, for having accepted our invitation to come. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for being here this evening. I'm very excited to talk about this topic. Uh, it's a topic which uh, is very interesting to me and which is also very fascinating, I think. Fascinating for several reasons. First of all, because uh, the science that you have out there beyond the Earth is completely different from what we have here. Um, and also, in second view, on a more philosophical bent, I think that having a Something of an understanding of how the universe works is also very useful for us as human beings and as a species to understand what our place is in this grand scheme of things. So, as you may know, cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole, its origins and its evolutions. And in wanting to uh, find a good topic for how we could approach this uh, idea of cosmology this afternoon, I decided that a good way to begin to understand the universe might be to understand what's in it, and uh, therefore the uh, subtitle uh, Galactic Geography. There is no time like the present, actually, to study the universe. I went to the New York Times and culled a few recent articles from that newspaper on things which are happening in science outside the Earth. I just want to direct your attention to three of these. The first one in which uh, May 5th, which was last week, um, scientists discovered the largest, I'm sorry, the oldest known galaxy, uh, 670 billion million years after the Big Bang. We'll be talking a little bit more about that and what it means. And the final point there I put down, which is the discovery of the Lanayaka, Lanayakea supercluster, which we'll also be talking a little bit about. Uh, and finally, I also want to point to the third from the bottom, January 6th, the Kepler telescope up in the sky discovered the 1,000th exoplanet. Kepler is a telescope that is looking for planets 
outside the solar system. And I hope it's not too presumptuous, but I decided in the course of this talk always to make a little bit of reference to the idea of life outside our own planet because, first of all, because it's a lot of fun to speculate, and second, because scientists tell us that it's probably going to be sooner rather than later that we actually find uh, something out there. So, we will proceed as follows. We'll start from the inside and work our way out. First, look at the uh, solar system, then look at the nearest stars, then the galaxy in which we live, and then the structures rather recent structures that have been discovered outside our galaxy. And finally, a little bit about the universe as a whole. Then I'll move on to discuss in one or two slides, it's doable, the history of the universe and where it's going. I'll try and answer a few interesting questions. Two are notably are what's the universe made of and are there any aliens out there? And finally, we'll talk about how the universe eventually will end because all things do end. This is cosmology light, so we won't be talking about hard science. There will be no formulas and equations. There will only be, hopefully, interesting fact, facts, illuminating uh, explanations, hopefully, and a lot of pretty pictures, because it is space, and there's a lot of pretty pictures coming from space. However, I do need to make one or two assumptions. Since space is such a large area, uh, to be talking about distances, if we talked in kilometers, we would be soon having too many zeros to count. So people tend to talk in terms of light years, which is the distance that a light beam travels in a single year. We'll also be talking light minutes, because inside the solar system, a light year is way too big a, uh, a measure. Uh, Light minutes and light years, once you get used to them, are actually quite useful. It's easier to say the Earth is light eight light minutes away from the Sun than to say it's 150 million kilometers. So let's start from the center, and the center, of course, would be our Sun, uh, the star that gives us light. This was taken with a camera that highlights different colors to show the different temperatures on the surface and on the corona of the Sun. The Sun is a star, quite a normal star actually. It is uh, 1.4 million kilometers across. That would be 110 times the Earth next to each other uh, around the diameter. It uh, has a huge mass, which is over 300,000 times that of the Earth, and it's about 4.5 billion years old. The whole solar system is about that old. It's what they call a population one star, which means it's a rather young star. There are much older stars. And uh, it is, uh, with a little bit of disprezzo, uh, called a yellow dwarf by the astronomers who study these things. It's a very active star. Um, as you can see from the corona up on the upper right there, that uh, particle uh, jet being spewed out and then being pulled back into the sun. The sun is in a constant equilibrium between the nuclear fusion explosions which push it outward and the gravitational attraction of its own mass that tries to pull it together. Uh, and we're very thankful, of course, that that uh, equilibrium has been going on for four and a half billion years. And it will be going on for another four billion years because the sun is halfway through its uh, life cycle. Uh, the sun's very heavy, by the way. If you had a bot wine bottle full of sun, it would weigh about 750 kilograms. So the sun is big for our solar system. It's much bigger than even the biggest planet, which is Jupiter. It would be about 10 times the diameter of Jupiter. On the other hand, it's not a particularly large star. Here are some other stars that we found, and the sun would be in the same um, scale, would be on the lower left. So it is a rather small star. Um, they're way much bigger stars. And since we're talking about stars for a moment, let's look at how they are born and how they die. You might want to make a mental note of some of the things which I'm pointing out in this uh, image here. First of all, all stars start with a stellar nebula. Nebula is simply a gas cloud which over time condenses, becomes bigger. The gravitational attraction of its parts make bigger and bigger pieces until you finally get a ball and eventually a protostar. If there's enough gas there, it keeps on growing. If there's not enough gas there, it becomes something like a planet. Uh, Jupiter may be a failed star. Saturn may be a failed star. If it does have enough hydrogen to reach a critical mass, it eventually ignites 
in an explosion, in a nuclear fusion explosion, and then can continue on for several billion years. That's where we are right now in, in the terms of the evolution of the sun. Stars the size of our sun eventually become red giants. They spew out uh, part of their core, become bigger and bigger. Our sun is expected over in, in about four billion years to become big enough to include the orbit of the Earth, and then they condense to a small white dwarf, which is a small star, which is very heavy. A teaspoon of a white dwarf would be several tons, several tens of or even hundreds of tons, and it spews out a lot of matter that is not in, does not stay in the white dwarf as a planetary nebula, and we'll be seeing a couple of those in some of the pictures as we go on. If the star is bigger, it becomes a massive supergiant and eventually explodes in one go as a supernova. Supernovas can be brighter than an entire galaxy of stars, which it means brighter than billions of stars at once and are visible only for a couple of days and a couple of weeks, and then they collapse into either a neutron star or, or a quasar. Uh, if we have time, we will look at some of, these, some of these things. But do remember the stellar nebula, the planetary nebula, and the supernova. So I'm going to quickly rush through the solar system, uh, and I ask for your indulgence here. We don't want to talk too long about the solar system, but in order to be complete as concerns geography, you really have to go at least through the planets that we know of. So the first one would be Mercury. Small planet, half the size of the sun. Here's a better picture of it, which highlights some of the detail on it. Um, it is a rocky planet. It's a very hot planet. One side is usually toward the sun. The other side is uh, away. The difference in temperature can be something like 600 degrees. Interesting fact about uh, Mercury that you wouldn't have thought is that it actually has ice on it. It has ice on the north and the south pole. And why can it have ice when it's so close to the sun? Well, the ice is down in crevices and valleys. It's literally where the sun never shines. Uh, not a lot of uh, hope for having life on Mercury. It's way too close and it's way too hot. Not a lot of hope for having any uh, life on Venus either. Venus is a core covered in a hard core like uh, the Earth has, but covered with clouds. Uh, CO2, carbon dioxide clouds, or sulf sulf sulfur dioxide clouds. When they talk about acid rain on Venus, they really mean acid rain. Sulfuric acid rains down from the clouds. The pressure is 92 times the pressure we have on Earth. Not a lot of hope for a life there, also because it is 500 degrees, the ambient temperature in Venus. And so, not much outlook for life there. The next planet, of course, is our own, and there is a lot of life there. Uh, it is a perfect planet for our kind of life. It's got water, it's got oxygen. And the point I want to make here is the following, that like the rest of the solar system, the Earth is four and a half billion years old. But we've had life on Earth for three and a half billion years. We found fossil evidence for it. So if you add the fact that the Earth first had to cool down, it had to get oceans. The water probably came from comets hitting us over millions of years. There is this theory that something hit us at one point which created the moon. If you lump all that together, you have probably have several hundred million years. The point is that it looks like the Earth started supporting life literally when it was ready to support life, which may tell us something about the propensity of life in the rest of the universe. The Earth is in what they call the, sorry, the habitable zone. The habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone. That means it's not too hot and it's not too cold, it's just right. So if our star, if our sun was smaller, we would be somewhere here and we would be outside the habitable zone, it would be too cool. If we were up here in a larger sun, then it would be too hot. So we're just at the right place to have life. And that's interesting because as I pointed out, the Kepler telescope is looking for other planets with life on it, and it's actually found a couple that which might, might have life. Here you have another uh, diagram in which you have the Earth up above, obviously in the habitable zone. They've also been a little more generous, and they've put Mars in there. And this is probably not habitable. This one here might be not good for us, though, because it's rather big, and probably the gravity is too much. But these two down here could well be planets that support life. So 
some form of life, not necessarily our own, but could support our life if we, if we went over there. The unfortunate thing is that they're 1,200 light years away from us and it's going to take us a very, very long time to get there. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later too. The habitable zone, the concept is not the only thing which is important to life on Earth. I don't want to, I'm simplifying here a little bit. The Earth also has a magnetic field which is generated by its iron core which moves around and that net magnetic field deflects the solar wind of charged particles that comes from the sun and hit, is hitting us constantly. If it wasn't for that magnetic field, we would probably be losing our atmosphere, have it being blown away bit by bit, which is probably what happened to the next planet, which is Mars, of course, the red planet. Almost no atmosphere left. A lot of ice on the northern and southern poles. Here's a rendition of what Mars might look like uh, with some of the ice or all of the ice uh, melted. Mars might well support life, maybe someday we'll live, well we know, but maybe our children or our grandchildren might live there. So that is the closest thing we have to life at the moment in the solar system. Fun fact here, the highest mountain on Mars, Olympus Mons, is three times the size of Everest and is the largest, highest mountain on the, in the solar system. Not a lot of space for life in the asteroid belt, here's the largest asteroid. It, has, it does have these intriguing little uh, light points here, probably not going to be alien cities because these are just little rocks, the asteroids. This is the biggest one and it's less than 500 kilometers across. Fun fact about, the, uh, about Ceres, the largest asteroid which you see here, is that it was discovered by an Italian astronomer at the University of Palermo. And he then wanted to name it Cerere Ferdinandea, after King Ferdinand of Naples, Sicily, his patron. That didn't go over very well with the rest of the European community at the time, and so they just named it Ceres. Okay, those are the inner planets. As you can see, only Mars might have life. I'm quickly going to zip through the outer planets, too. Next one is Jupiter, the biggest planet in our solar system. It is two and a half times the mass of everything else. It's really big. Uh, it's far away. And yet, um, despite the fact that you have an Earth year being, where is it, 12 Earth, uh, a Jupiter year being 12 Earth years, the planet rotates about its axis once every 10 hours, which means there's huge storms going on there. Uh, so again, probably not too hospitable to life. Given those huge storms, it's actually interesting that we have this red spot here, which has been there that we can see. Our astronomers have been following it for the last 150 years at least. Jupiter also has 60 moons. When I was growing up, it had like 12, but they keep discovering more moons each time they send something up there. Next planet would be Saturn. I think indisputably the most beautiful planet in the solar system. Here you see its rings. Saturn has been um, intensely studied since the Cassini uh, space probe went to it, and we've now found that it has something on the order of 14 major rings. It has white spots just like Jupiter, except that these don't last. It is 10 times more distant to the, than the uh, Earth from the Sun. And it is actually a very light planet. If you put Saturn in a bathtub, it would float because there's, there's literally nothing but, but gases there. One more interesting thing I want to point out about this planet is this brown spot up here. If we, do, if we look at it more closely, as Cassini did at the time when it did its flyover, you can see it's actually some sort of a meteorological phenomenon that has an eerie hexagon form, which is quite interesting. It's huge. You can see it with the Earth next to it here. We don't really know what that is. Fun fact. Next planet is Uranus. Uranus, uh, that's its moon Ariel they're uh, casting a shadow on it. Something you immediately notice from Uranus compared to the other planets we've had photographs of up until now is it's tilted. All the other planets pretty much have their north pole pointing the same direction as the north pole of the sun. This one doesn't. Its pole is always pointing to the sun. At that point you don't even know whether it's the south pole or the north pole. It also has rings and it has moons and also these are perpendicular to, ever, to the solar plane. Finally, another uh, last fun fact for the Americans here. It was discovered by William Herschel in 1781, and he wanted to name it after his patron, King George III. 
that didn't go over very well either. And so finally, we named it for um, the father of the uh, father of Saturn in Greek and Latin mythology, who was which was the god Uranus. Final planet would be Neptune, another giant uh, cloud planet, if you so will. None of these planets really have much propensity for life. This one is a lot further away, and it was discovered in 1841. What happened here is that they were tracking Uranus after its discovery and discovered that it wasn't going where their equations told them it should be going. And so a French astronomer, uh, Le Verrier, he mapped out where he thought this new planet, which they thought was influencing the orbit of Uranus, should be. And indeed, he was right. And the English astronomer James Chalice found it a few years later, exactly where Le Verrier had said it would be. And he was a gentleman, of course, and he gave the credit for the discovery to Monsieur Le Verrier. And Le Verrier turned around and decided he'd name the planet after himself. Again, that didn't go over very well, and since there were no more, uh, Uranus in mythology does not have a father, they decided simply to call it after the god of the sea. So, that's our tally so far. Mars might have life, not much else out there that would. However, we're not finished with the solar system yet. We still have all these moons that are out there. Uh, you can see Earth's moon up on the top left, then comes Mars' two moons, then come the four major moons that Galileo found several hundred years ago. Not much uh, happening here either. There might be life on the second planet of Saturn, Enceladus, which you, if you looked at the press release uh, slide, if you saw that, or um, the first one or the third one that I showed, they've recently discovered water there, and of course water is something that might well harbor life. So there's more possibilities of having life on these moons than there is on most of the planets that we have. These, by the way, are not the only moons. We have over 166 moons discovered so far. Uh, only 50 of them, 50 or 60 of them have names, and Saturn itself uh, alone already has 150 moons. So that's the solar system, but no, we're not done with the solar system yet, because if you go further out from the solar system, it turns out you have a second asteroid belt. Another belt of rubble and ice out there, of which the major representative is the planet Pluto, which was taken here by the New Horizons uh, spacecraft, which is going toward Pluto. You can see its moon there going in a circle around it. Quite spectacular. Pluto used to be a planet. It's now called a, a dwarf planet. The reason being that they found more planets out in this asteroid zone and then realized it was actually another asteroid belt. Mark it on your calendars. July 14th of this year, the New Horizons a spacecraft which took this picture will be actually doing a flyby over Pluto and will then decide and be able to measure the size of the planet or dwarf planet and then decide whether or not this one is actually the largest object in the asteroid zone out there because we're not sure. So that's going to be very exciting to people who are interested in this sort of thing. Now one more thing I'd like to say about these asteroid belts and that's this. It is quite possible in the past as now possible that these two asteroid belts uh, have periodically been influenced by the planets closest to them. That would be Jupiter and it would be Neptune. As you know, we've had several mass extinctions in the Earth over the past uh, history, the last one being 65 million years ago where current theory holds, although people are saying maybe it didn't happen that way, but current theory still holds that that was when the dinosaurs were, uh, became extinct due to the collision of an asteroid with the Earth. So. The possibility, the real possibility, as a matter of fact, is that these planets can dislodge some of these uh, asteroids from their orbits and send them spinning into the inner solar system, which of course for us would be quite dangerous. Now beyond the Kuiper belt, as we called it, um, there is a second belt. It's actually a cloud. The Kuiper belt is in the solar plane, whereas the Oort cloud is a spherical collection of asteroids and above all comets. By the way, when I talk about asteroid belts, it's not like in the Star Wars movies, you know, with the, the ships weaving back and forth trying to avoid being hit. 
uh, the entire Oort cloud is, em is estimated to be the mass of about five times the Earth. And these are huge distances. The Oort cloud extends over a, uh, a light year out from the solar system. So it doesn't mean that there's a lot of rubble out there. It simply means it's a little less empty than some of the other places in the solar system. Uh, this is where co comets come from, specifically Halley's Comet, for instance. Uh, we've, we don't know about the Oort cloud. We haven't found anything out there. Or we don't have any telescopes finding anything out there, but we know that comets periodically come from all sorts of directions. So we know that this is something that is spherical. It's not in the solar plane. And the other reason we know that there's a cloud out there is because there are comets. Comets are bits of ice and rubble. And as you know, whenever they get near the sun, they have these beautiful tails, which is just the heat of the sun uh, uh, boiling off some of the gas that makes up the comet. So if the solar system is four and a half billion years old, and these comets have been coming in all the time, they wouldn't be there anymore. Ergo, there must be something out there where these comets live and only occasionally gets pushed down into our areas. And that's the solar system. Not much uh, life uh, out there, maybe, except in our own planet. And, but now we have a whole universe to look at. And the first, of course, is the n nearest stars. The nearest stars are uh, three stars at once, Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and Proxima Centauri, which is indeed the closest star to us. It's that little one there. You can't really see it because it's a very small star. And uh, these, these, okay, first of all, these stars are four, mm, four light years away from our solar system and they are actually candidates for planets. We simply haven't been able to find out whether any of these planets are livable uh, or habitable. I won't spend more time with these stars. I'd rather go and look, at, look a little further into the nearest neighborhood of stars we have. If you go out a little bit further, and the concentric circles here are one light year apart, you can see that within about 20 light years, you have something like 50, somewhere between 50 and 100 stars. And of these, a good 10% might have planets. The closest stars to us, there's only two of them that might have planets. Uh, all the others are a little further away. It would probably take us somewhere along 50,000 years with our current technology to, to, to get out to the farthest of these stars. So we have a ways to go before we find any life uh, in these nearest stars specifically. Now, we tend to think of stars as fixed points in the sky. The ancients always did, but it turns out it's not really that way. These things move around. And I want to look at closely at this um, schema here, this graph. If you look here, you have time in thousands of years. And if you look on the vertical axis, you have distance from the sun in terms of light years. Now, that point zero over there is where the sun would be at our present time. And you can see the Oort cloud rising there. It goes up to a little more than a light year away from, from the bottom. And then you can see where the nearest stars are. Proxima Centauri, as we said, right now is about four light years away. But if you wait another 20, 25,000 years, it's going to be within uh, three light years from us. Still quite far away, lucky for us. Because if it got much closer, it could then do the same thing that I was talking about before, which is dislodge something from the Oort cloud and send it perhaps spinning into uh, the inner solar system. It looks like this might not never happen. Actually, there, it might happen again within about 200,000 years, uh, I think, in the future. And actually, we know that a star did come within the Oort cloud within the last 70,000 years. And it may simply be a coincidence, but I find it interesting to note that 70,000 years is the time frame we were. We assume that our species started moving out of Africa due to climatological change at the time. Caused by something like this? I don't know, but it's fun to speculate. So those are the nearest stars. Now let's go a little bit further out, a lot further out to our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, here in an art artist's rendition obviously because you can't really map it very easily. Uh, it's like trying to map a forest when you're in one of the trees. It's a spiral galaxy. It is about 120,000 light years wide. Our sun is going around it on this uh, orbit, and we orbit the center of the Milky Way, which might have a big black hole, by the way. We orbit it every 240 million years. 
So the last time we were in the same place we are now, the dinosaurs were just beginning to, to become uh, the dominant species of the planet. Uh, the Milky Way is also uh, on a collision course with one of its neighbors. We'll look at that in a moment. But first I want to look at some of the interesting and fun things in the galaxy. This is the uh, Rosette Nebula. If you remember the slide about the star history, the star life cycle, this is one of these first nebulas, stellar nebulas, in which stars are created. Uh, you can see light coming from it in different colors, indicating different wavelengths, different temperatures, uh, and the light is being uh, generated because the stars inside that are beginning to be born are heating it up, and therefore the nebula emanates light. An even more spectacular nebula, the Orion Nebula, this one is actually visible, not such beautiful, but as a little patch of something with binoculars if you know where the Orion constellation is. This is a prototype of a stellar nebula, and there's stars being born there in the middle and are heating the gas up and making it uh, show us these pretty colors. Different type of nebula. This one here is a planetary nebula. If you recall, I said that uh, stars that become red giants eventually collapse and spew out a bunch of gas and other material. Uh, by the way, they spew out not just gas, they also spew out what astronomers call heavy elements. A heavy el element to an astronomer is everything that's, hot, that's heavier than helium. So everything in this room literally is a heavy element. And these heavy elements are only created in stars, and so we need these planetary explosions, uh, these planetary nebula, because otherwise we would never be able to form planets with things like iron or carbon for our bones or water for our seas and so on and so forth. Another planetary nebula, again, each of these has a small white dwarf in the center, uh, and if you see something in the center in the picture, it's probably not the white dwarf, it's probably a star behind there, because further back, because we can't see white dwarfs very well. One more that's even more spectacular, the Helix Nebula, but they're all sort of the same thing, red giants that have died, stars that have died, and um, spewed out this stuff. Something completely different, the remnants of a supernova in the Magellanic Clouds, which are uh, smaller galaxies orbiting our own galaxy. This is really beautiful. Uh, basically, a supernova just collapses and exp explodes and then collapses completely and leaves these remnants of gas and heavy elements going out into space. This one happened about 400 years ago. The remnants have traveled about 23 years by now. We had no chance to see this 400 years ago. However, there's another one that we actually did see. It's called Kepler supernova, which happened in our own Milky Way and was observed by several European astronomers. I don't know why they named it after Kepler. He's a very important guy, of course, in 1604. And for a couple of weeks, this was the brightest object in the entire night sky. So that's inside our little, little, big Milky Way galaxy of 200 billion stars and 120 light years across. Now, like stars, uh, galaxies can have little orbiting planets, which are dwarf galaxies. Here we see two of them, the Mag Magellanic Clouds. And then, of course, immediately you ask the question, well, what's beyond our own galaxy and these smaller galaxies out there, and people have been measuring this for at least a generation, and they call the galaxies in our little neighborhood, I think it's a very quaint name, the local group. Mm -hmm. The local group is, um, if you can see, I can hardly see, the concentric rings here should be uh, 10 million light years by now, and the local group is about a group of 20 to 30 galaxies within the nearest 40, 50 million light years. Only two of the galaxies are really big, the one in the center, the one in red, which is ours, and this one here, which is the Andromeda galaxy. All the others are small dwarf galaxies. That means they only have a few billion stars. I said before that we're on a collision with one of the galaxies in our neighborhood, and it's this one, the Andromeda galaxy, which is a very large galaxy. It's um, one trillion stars, heavy about four million light years away and we expect to hit it in about five million years. It's coming toward us, we're going toward it. When I say two galaxies collide, it doesn't mean that there's going to be this huge bang and then everything disappears. No, it probably means that they will sort of intertwine 
uh, and then the gravitational forces will create a new galaxy and some stuff will be spewed out and some stuff will just become part of the greater whole. One thing I do want to point out, and it's obvious, you've probably seen it by now, is that most of space is really empty. Mm -hmm. So even though it looks like the center is full of stars and, and, and almost solid, it's not. It's completely empty. Well, completely empty. It's quite empty, and so the, the uh, chances of collisions in general are very small. This is a spiral galaxy like our own. You can't really see the spirals, though. Here's a better one. This one is rather far away. Spiral galaxies are one type of galaxy. There are other types. Here's a very nice galaxy called the Sombrero Galaxy, which every, everyone loves to photograph. These photographs, by the way, are all from the Hubble Telescope, which has been giving us wonderful snapshots of the universe for the past 25 years. Uh, then there's another type of galaxy, which is just a conglomeration of stars, a spherical galaxy, a uh, spheroid galaxy, spherical galaxy. These are like little anchovies in a swarm. They're all um, circling around each other. And so, okay, we know there's galaxies out there. Uh, the question then becomes, are there any larger structures than galaxies? How do galaxies hold together? Well, it turns out that scientists have found larger structures. Uh, about 15 years ago, they decided we were all part of what's called the Virgo cluster, a cluster of galaxies in the, con in the general direction of the constellation Virgo. 2,000 galaxies, and then a few years later they discovered, no, the Virgo cluster is actually part of something even larger, which is the Virgo supercluster, and we'll be talking more about superclusters, that's sort of the, 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 the way they refer to these large structures now, and these are 50,000 galaxies over 110 million light years long. This is a galactic filament, as they call them, and we'll be seeing that there are millions of these filaments in the sky. Here's a putative map of the Virgo supercluster. You can see the filament structure from the top right down to the lower left. The concentric rings, if you can see them here, are already 10 million light years uh, across. So the whole thing, as I said before, is 100 million light years, 110 million light years. And then there are more superclusters like this. Virgo is here in the center. Our nearest neighbors are Perseus, Coma, and Shapely. And so we surmise that the universe is full of these things. And that's the way the story would have stood until last September. Uh, as I pointed out in the third slide, the one about the press releases, they announced the discovery of something called the Lanaya Kea supercluster, which is even bigger than Virgo. Here are our na nearest neighbors again, Perseus, Coma, and Shapely, as I pointed out. And yet now scientists are saying this is all one gigantic supercluster, and our filament is somewhere along this line here. And probably our local group is somewhere here. Why is this one supercluster? Well, you have these little, these little arrows which are telling you where the gravitation, uh, gravitational attraction is taking uh, these different galac galactic filaments. And you can see that the ones outside the, the red border there are going in all sorts of directions, and the one inside in white are generally going to one specific place. And that is what is now quaintly known as the Great Attractor, which is a very sinister sounding name. Uh, the Great Attractor, we don't know what it is. It is probably a, well, it's a, it's a gravitational well, maybe a con con conglomeration of black holes or something like that. It's quite unclear what it is at this point. But uh, it's quite an amusing uh, concept to think that thousands of galaxies are all going to the same point, even while they are exploding with the rest of the universe, which is something we'll be talking about uh, a little further down the road. And I find it quite apropos due to the fact that I saw that there's a Van Gogh exhibition here yeah. in Florence, and I saw some Van Gogh paintings here in yeah. another room that maybe Vincent was on to something when he, he put galactic filaments and even a couple of attractors into one of his better known paintings. Okay, finally, uh, last slide on the structure of the universe. This is what the universe looks like. Uh, I say the bigger picture, not the bigger picture, but the biggest picture. This is the biggest picture and it's only been available to us for several years now. Scientists spent almost 10 years cataloging the speeds and the distances of about 45,000 galaxies. On the lower right here you can see this scale which tells you the ones that are furthest away from us are red and the ones that are closest are blue. 
This is a three-dimensional, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, a 360-degree map, just like an Earth map. You can't see much here in the middle because this is the galactic plane where the Milky Way is and there's a lot of dust and other things there which impede our ability to see stuff further out there. But so this, this is what the final universe looks like. It is a gigantic collection of uh, filaments with occasional con uh, superclusters in between and also large spaces and voids with, which, uh, there is, in which there is absolutely nothing and it is, it's expanding in all directions as we'll see more in a moment. By the way, the, the Lanaya, Lanayakea supercluster is only the ninth largest structure like this that we found in the universe. Uh, so far. The astronomers love to give them quaint and prosaic names. There's one called the Great Sloan Wall, you know, which is, is again, 300, 300 million light years of galaxies. Okay, that was the way the universe looks from different uh, points of view. And now I'd quickly like to talk to, about, talk to you about the, um, the evolution of the universe. Current theory holds, of course, we know that, that the universe started about 14 billion years ago in a big bang in which all of matter and all of energy sprang into being, was created, pick whatever, whatever term you like most. Uh, there has since then, as far as our current theory holds, nothing new coming into the universe. So there is a certain fixed amount of matter, there's a fixed amount of energy. For the first uh, several hundred thousand years, this thing expanded at an incredible rate. It's called the period of inflation. And it was nothing more than a gigantic cloud of particles. These particles eventually, eventually started to coalesce. They became a gas. The gas then coalesced some more. They became nebula. And then actually started forming stars. But as you can see, it took almost 400 million years for these stars to form. And this is what they call the Dark Ages. So referring back to the third slide with the press release is when they said they'd found the oldest galaxy we found so far is 670 million years. It means it's only 270 million years after galaxies even started to be produced. Since then, the universe has been a factory for stars, more stars coming into being, stars dying, and it's gotten bigger all the time. And now the interesting interesting discovery that happened a few years ago, well, a few years, about 15 years ago, is that they discovered it is actually uh, accelerating in its expansion. That's why this cone here starts sort of moving out more pronounced toward the end. And this is a phenomenon that we don't really have an explanation for. We're going to, we call it dark energy, and we will be talking about that next. How are we doing on time? I don't know. Ah, we're doing okay. I'm almost... Well, we're not doing that, okay. Alessio says we're doing okay. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's talk for a moment about what the universe is actually made of. Up until about 15, 20 years, we thought that the universe, the universe was mainly uh, suns, stars, largely, a whole bunch of neutrinos, which we won't get into now, but um, these are particles that uh, interact with almost nothing. So it's, they're really not so important for the evolution of the universe. And that tiny sliver in blue would be everything else, planets, uh, us, and so on and so forth. Turns out now that that's not the way it is. This universe that we thought w was is only 1% of the actual estimated universe. Another 4% is made out of huge clouds of hydrogen and helium, and then 25% is made out of dark matter, and 70-some-odd percent is made out of dark energy. And those are the two topics I quickly want to... Uh, talk about now. These are just two things to explain stuff we do not know. Dark matter is supposedly what holds the galaxies together. Here's what happened. They started estimating the mass of different galaxies. They started estimating how quickly these galaxies were turning around, uh, rotating, and they discovered that some, there was a big problem here because the mass of the galaxy was were not big enough to maintain stability. The spiral arm should have just swung out into space like this tadpole galaxy that you see here. Tadpole galaxy is not, uh, uh, has an excuse because scientists think that what happened to the tadpole galaxy is that another galaxy sort of swept by this guy here and basically with its gravity pulled off one of its arms. But in the aggregate, Galaxies were not supposed to be stable, and so scientists came up with an uh, explanation, 
And they said, it must be dark matter. And then they did more calculations and figured out, well, if we have so many galaxies in the universe, how much dark matter must, they be, must there be to maintain them stable? And they discovered it must be 25% of the entire mass of the universe. That's dark matter. Dark energy, I don't even have a good slide here because nobody knows what it is. It is supposedly what makes the universe fly apart ever more, ever more quickly. And there's a, certain, uh, there's a certain disagreement among scientists. Some of them say that they don't believe in dark energy. I find dark energy repulsive. Yes, that's exactly what it's supposed to be doing. Again, it's something that we don't know what it is. Um, but I find it interesting that both dark matter and dark energy have to do with gravity. And it tells us that we don't really understand gravity yet. And I'm going to make a little detour into science now. If you know that the, the basic two mm, new theories in the 20th century were quantum theory on the one hand and relativity on the other hand. Quantum theory was developed by people like Heisenberg and, and Schrodinger and so on. And it explains three of the four forces in the universe. Relativity was developed by Einstein and it explains gravity. Now here's the problem. The two theories are not compatible they don't work together mathematically. Something is wrong. We know there's something wrong out there. And I just find it very intriguing that it's specifically gravity phenomena here that uh, are eluding us for the moment. Uh, most scientists believe that eventually quantum theory will, quote, unquote, absorb relativity. Relativity will have to be adjusted to, to, to fit into a final theory of everything. And so this is, to me, some sort of an indication that uh, yes, that's the direction that we're going to be taking. If you hearken back to uh, about a hundred years ago, at the beginning of the 19th, I'm sorry, beginning of the 20th century, when these two theories were going to be born, most physicists thought that pretty much they, they, they discovered everything. They had good theories, it all worked, and then along came Bohr and Einstein and these people and discovered that it was way more complicated than anyone thought, and thus new theories were created. Okay. In summary, the universe is about 14 billion years old. It's about 92 billion years wide. We didn't do this calculation, but trust me on this. It's big, but it's finite. Uh, I, don't want, I don't like the, the idea of the infinite in the universe. The universe is not infinite. There is no infinity in physics. Infinity is a concept that works in mathematics. It doesn't work in physics. So it is finite, but obviously it's expanding. It's also flat. Up until about a generation ago, there was this big discussion, is the universe curved or is it flat? Can I send a beam of light shooting off in that direction, wait three billion or three trillion years and it'll come back to me from this direction because the, the space itself is curved? No, that's probably with 99.5% uh, sureness not the case. It's uh, suffused by lights and suns and neutrinos and a lot of dark stuff that we don't understand. Uh, although I have to point out that dark matter and dark energy are only two things. They may make up 90% of the universe, yes, but it's the only two things we don't understand. So we understand a lot of other things. And finally, it's exploding, and it's getting emptier and emptier. Um, I'm going to rush through a couple of calculations on how many stars there are. Um, because I want to talk a little bit about how many planets there might be and how many planets uh, might have life on it. So I won't do this calculation. Um, it just comes out to that we have about oops, five with 22 zeros behind it stars in the entire universe. And the Kepler telescope by now has found a thousand exoplanets on some of these stars and there are another 10,000 candidates out there waiting to be confirmed are there planets or not. Why don't we know this? Well, because planets don't give off light. We have to figure out, it's very hard to find a planet around a star. I mean, stars are bright, planets are not. How do you find it? There's two ways of doing this. One is uh, the wobbly, the wobble effect. Even though a planet is small, it makes the star that it's circling around wobble back and forth and we can see that. That's not what Kepler does. Kepler does something else, which is even more intriguing. If a planet passes in front of its star and we're in the line of sight, then the brightness becomes a little less. So Kepler is out there tracking the brightness of about 145,000 stars at any given time, and that's how it finds planets. And it's found a lot of planets. Overall, this would translate into 100 billion planets in our own galaxy, 
which is quite a lot when you think about it. Now, how many of those are habitable? They have to be in the habitable zone and so on and so forth. We can estimate that there may be up to 11 billion habitable planets in the uh, galaxy, which is a lot. Again, how many of these have life on them? Well, here is where it begins to become a little bit tricky. We might say, well, let's assume one in a thousand has life on it. That would still give us 11 million planets uh, for our galaxy. Is that really a lot? It might be a lot, but there's some problems here. First of all, we don't know enough about life to say. We, I'm, I'm speculating here. I love to speculate because I love the idea of people finding life on other planets, but we really don't know enough about life. We don't know how it begins. We also don't know how it ends in the end. Uh, species may have come and have gone, and they may have already left life on other planets, but now they're gone. Uh, also, the final point there, we've been looking for about 50 years for radio signals out in the heavens which would be life like our own and we have found nothing. Does that mean there's nothing out there? Not necessarily. Um, let's turn to the experts. There's a certain physicist of Italian origin named Enrico Fermi who was in the Manhattan Project and he has he put up the Fermi paradox which is basically where are all the aliens? Uh, Fermi, rightly so, figured out that with our level of technology even if we go slowly, we never reach light speeds and it's 120,000 years to get to the other end of the galaxy, it would only take us 10 million years to populate the entire galaxy. So if we could do it with our rockets, why can't somebody else do it? Why haven't we been visited many times by aliens? Well, Arthur C. Clarke, who's a noted science fiction author, he says, yeah, there's probably a lot of aliens out there, but why would they bother with us, right? We're so insignificant. More to the point, uh, again from the third slide, the one with the press releases, they, uh, the chief NASA scientist uh, in a press conference when they announced that they'd found water on one, one of the moons of Saturn said that according to the, their speculation is that we'll find some form of life almost surely within 30 years. But to me the most convincing argument, and I put a question mark under it, is the last one because I don't know who said this. I think it's very pertinent though. The universe never seems to make just one of anything. Look around everywhere. There's always gazillions of the same thing. Okay. Oh, another quick question here. Um, will something hit us? With all these asteroids up there in the asteroids belt. It is a great comfort to me to know that there is a project where they're actually tracking asteroids and to make a long story short, they don't think we're going to be hit anytime, in the, anytime soon. So, that's a good sigh of relief. Let's have a final look at how the universe will end. It's been expanding, but where does it go from here? Well, there's three possibilities. The first is that eventually gravity pulls it all together again and we get what we call the big bust, uh, the opposite of the big bang. But since we've seen that it's now expanding more rapidly, that's probably not going to happen. There's another theory called the big rip, I like to call it the big bust, in which the acceleration continues and continues until the actual fabric of reality gets pulled apart and within a finite time all distances become infinite. Uh, this is just, they, they were tweaking the, the the equations of gravity that Einstein put up for, to get this solution, and I really don't believe it's, uh, it's a very, it's a very uh, probable thing. I think most likely what will happen is the third possibility here, external expansion, um, and this would be that over time things get more and more empty, things continue to fly apart, and we have what you call heat death. Heat death is as you know, heat flows from warm bodies to cold bodies. If you wait long enough, and all the warm bodies will be gone. The suns will go out. They'll use all their uh, fuel. Things will become dark again, and we will just have a gigantic soup, probably a little warmer than space is right now, but we will have nothing, just an ever-expanding soup of space getting darker and darker. And that will be the end of the universe. But that is a rather um, despondent note upon which to end, and I don't want to leave it that. For the foreseeable future, for the foreseeable future, uh, the universe will be just as we see it now. It will be bright, and it will be fascinating, and it will be huge, 
and we will continue to be hopefully a non-irrelevant part of it and learn more about it as time goes on. Thank you very much. Thank you.